God that we worship, amen? And what a faithful God that we worship. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. I know I, I love that song, and I, I think it's just so fitting with communion and with us going through Romans. I just think about the fact that despite our unfaithfulness, God remains faithful, amen? And it's so easy to, I mean, forget that or to take something like that for granted. But I think especially as we look at where we're at in Romans, we see a whole lot of unfaithfulness on our part, but where we left off. We have seen the faithfulness. We have seen the righteousness of God revealed, and it's in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are so happy you're here. My name is Cameron Isaacs. I am the uh, kids ministry director here at Journey Church, and we are just, whoa, jeez. And we're, we're, we're so happy um, to be here, to be worshiping with you today. Uh, if it's your first time, we want to say welcome. Um, we are a community church. We're a relationship church. We would love the chance to get to know you. Um, so if you are here and you haven't filled out a, a new guest card, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, it's not so we can hunt you down and end up on your doorstep and be all weird. No, we just want to reach out and connect with you, get to know you more, answer any questions that you guys may have, and um, kind of just say welcome. And we have some really exciting things coming up, especially this month. It's crazy that it's already October. You could feel it a little bit in the air this morning. I was like, wow, what's going on? Why didn't I grab a sweater? It felt weird. Um, but one of the things we got coming up, uh, we get so excited about is Trunk or Treat here at Journey. For those of you who have been a part of it before, you know how amazing this is. And this is just such an opportunity for us as a church to reach wider into our community. It's, it's crazy. I remember last year kind of being new to the church and seeing just so many people, so many families show up. And this is such an opportunity for us as a church to just introduce ourselves to the community. And so we would love for you guys to be a part of that, whether it's having a, bringing your truck, decorating your trunk, giving out some candy, um, whether it's we will start next week taking water and candy donations to kind of help with handing that out or help with some of the games and whatnot coming up. So that's an amazing way that you guys can be getting involved and helping us as we reach wider into our community. And along with that, we will have some kind of carnival games going on inside and we would love to have some people to help station that. So it's not just me sprinting back and forth and running like suicides. Um, so if that would be something you'd be interested in, there's absolutely an opportunity there. It's, it's amazing to see kind of just the face of these kids light up. They get excited as they get this candy. And the parents behind them kind of getting to see how we interact. And I think being able to show Jesus to these kids, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So if you would keep an eye out as more information comes about that, we would love for you to join us. And another thing that we've been able to do and really reach wider in our community in an amazing way and to use this building in an amazing way is partnering with iHelp. I know we talk about it quite a bit. What, what we get to do is bring in some of the incidentally homeless and pretty much give them just a meal and a place to stay for a night and a chance to sit with them, to talk with them, to meet with them and just get to know them a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity. And it's an amazing thing that we do. And so we actually have a table outside for those who are interested in kind of signing up and helping with that. It's on Wednesday evenings. And whether it's just popping in for a couple hours and just let, letting these people know that they're seen, um, letting them know that they're loved, just sharing a meal with them, whether it's helping cook, whatever that may be, we would so love your help in that. So we have a table right by the door. So if you wouldn't mind stopping by there on the way out, if you're looking for more information, that would be amazing. And the last exciting thing that we have coming up, because with... October being here, that means December is even closer, and that means we got our Christmas musical coming up, and we are super thrilled about that. We're actually kicking off auditions today at 1, so if your kiddo's interested um, and hadn't heard the past couple weeks, I, I've been trying to get the information as out there as I could, but I kind of don't do the best job of that sometimes. Um, we would love to have them. We, are, we have speaking roles available, so just come. We'll have something for them to read, um, to audition. And then we, if they want to sing a solo, have them sing a little something real quick. It could be something like happy birthday. It could be something like, it could be whatever. If you want to belt out some, like, queen ballad, if one of your kids is really on it, I'd say they go for it, too. That'd be awesome. Um, so we got that coming up as well. And that'll be the evening of December 17th. So as that comes up, we would love for you to join us. It is a chance for families to come into the church to I mean, celebrate the kids and the families here at Journey Church and um, to just welcome them and invite them to Christmas and everything that follows. So I'm going to go ahead and pray as we continue through Romans. Carlisle will be preaching in Romans chapter 4 today, kind of picking up where we left off. And so we'll go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for um, just the opportunity to be here, to praise you, to be face-to-face -face with what a, what a faithful 
and, and good God that you are, Lord. I pray that as we enter this time that we wouldn't just treat this as something that's trivial or treat this as just something to gain more information to stock, but would it be something that impacts us, something that goes beyond um, just Sundays and something that carries us into our week and carries us into a deeper uh, relationship with you. So I pray it all in your name. Amen. Thanks, Cameron. Was it great to sing a hymn or what? Yeah. Um, Carson was just sharing with me that how hard that is because they just don't write them the same way. He said his hands had to move all over even though. So hymns are great. I love that hymn. I wanted to share with you a little bit of the story of that hymn. So that hymn was written by Thomas Chisholm and he wrote it inspired by that verse that was shared with you by Lindsay. So he was a, a regular guy, um, kind of smart though. He was too smart for his own good. And by the time he was 16, he was a school teacher. And then he became an editor of a pretty successful newspaper right around that time. So he was kind of ahead of his peers. And then he got a calling from God to become a pastor. And he became a pastor, but shortly, when he was 26, and shortly after that, he um, got married. And I'm sure it's not connected, but then he got really sick. That was my joke for the morning. <laughs> got married and got really sick. So he, he really got sick. He couldn't be a pastor anymore. Became an insurance salesman. And I don't know what that says about insurance sales. But he never fully recovered. He was sick for the rest of his life. And really because of how sick he was, he was financially destitute for the rest of his life. He wrote that song that we just sang about the faithfulness of God when he was 57 years old. He got sick when he was 26 years old. So he... It's kind of a cool thing to think about. He, it might be kind of run-of-the-mill stuff as we think about sickness and things in our life that test whether or not we believe God's faithful or not. But not him. He was faithful to God. He's faithful to his family, faithful to his church, even though he couldn't be a pastor anymore until his dying day. And he, he wrote that song about God's faithfulness. Other people looking at his life might have said, hmm, I don't know, Thomas. I don't know if God's all that faithful to you. I mean, look, you're... You're in financial poor health, you're in physical poor health, and you write that song. I don't know if God's been faithful, and he wrote that song instead. But you might say that it might be more appropriate for us to say about Thomas Chisholm, great is my faithfulness, him, because he was a faithful man. Not thy faithfulness only, but his faithfulness. That's what we're talking about today, your faithfulness in light of God's faithfulness. So let's start with a question. How great is your faithfulness. If we change the word thy to my, how great is my faithfulness to God? How great is it? I like to do the one to 10 scale. Go ahead and rate yourself. 10 is Thomas Chisholm. Where, where do you stand there? What things are your faith based on, your faithfulness? Is it based on your circumstances? Is it based on your knowledge, your understanding? Is it based on your hopes and dreams, did you catch the key word there, your, your, your? Is your faithfulness based on when things are going right, when God is doing what you think God should do, your faithfulness is great, which makes it purely transactional. I will do stuff and God will do stuff because I do stuff. That's kind of like, God, I'll scratch your back, but I expect you to scratch my back. So today we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 4, and we're going to change that up a little bit. We're going to, in the face of God's faithfulness, we're going to look at our faithfulness. So here's the main thought. Evidence of our faith, not existence of it, flows from works. That's a big statement. It'll be up there for a couple of minutes. You can be thinking about that. We'll unpack it as we go. Evidence of our faith, not existence of it, flows from works. So that's the theme. I want you to think about this. Do you know that God revels in your faithfulness? We sing a song about reveling in God's faithfulness. Do you realize that God revels in your faithfulness? What? God revels in our faithfulness? Yeah, he does. We're going to learn more about that, get a grip on that this morning. So if you haven't opened up your, your phones or your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, I'm going to be reading through that chapter, start in just a few minutes. But let's pray and prepare to hear from Jesus himself. Jesus, we thank you for today. We, uh, we come today when the weather's nice and we pause to worship you, but we come here today not just to get smarter. We come here today not to just make our lives easier. 
but we come here to know you more and to know your Bible more so that we can live differently when we leave this place. May that be what happens this morning, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So we've been looking at chapters one through three already. We've learned some things about us that hasn't been good. I know you're laughing because I said omen. Yeah, that was like from Satan, not from me. So we've learned that we are desperately depraved, that there's no hope for us without Jesus. I said last week this line that uh, with unrighteousness, it can never commingle with the righteousness of God ever unless Jesus is there in the midst. And so we saw as we went through chapters one and the first part of chapter three, all the way one, two, and the first part of three, the bad news. But then we started to get to the good news in verse 23 and verse 24 when it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then, but we don't have verse 24 memorized that we are justified by his, God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The only way unrighteousness and righteousness can live together and co-mingle is through Jesus. So let's talk about your faithfulness now. Here's another question. Have you ever put yourself in a really bad position where you did it? You're responsible for putting yourself in that position, and there's nothing that you can do to get out of it. You can't make up for it. You can't take it away because you're the one that did it, and there's nothing you can do. What does that feel like? That's not a comfortable place to be, is it? It's not really an encouraging place to be. It's not an inspirational place to be. In fact, it's downright demoralizing because you're the one that did it, debilitating. It gets in the way for you of you getting, doing anything bigger than that because you just overcome. So that, that was just chapters one through three, the first part of three. So we have that grace shift starting in uh, verse 23. Chapter four is even another turn for us. There is something we can do when we've done something that we just can't retrieve. That's unrighteousness. We can't retrieve it. Jesus retrieves it for us. Chapter four tells us that there's something even more that we can do, and it's faith. Your faithfulness. That's the theme of today. Not only do we have faith, which is belief, but we have faith that's active, or what I like to think about in my life and in our life as a church, active faith. Our hands aren't tied. Our hands aren't handcuffed to unrighteousness and sin. We know that because we're saved by Jesus' grace, but there's more that we can do as we believe and as we have faith. We get to be contributors, not just consumers of the grace of Jesus. Did you catch that? We can contribute to God because he revels in our faithfulness and we contribute to our own lives and we contribute to the lives of our community because of the grace of Jesus. That's why that main thought is so important to us today, that we can have active faith. So with that said, let me jump into the text. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? So we're going to be talking about Abraham for a little bit. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. So Abraham did some good things. God came to him first. God is the great initiator, but he was just like us. There wasn't enough good things. There was plenty of bad things. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Believed. Sometimes we think it's this intellectual thing. Believed means to believe like there's something at stake, because there is. It's you. It's your eternity. Believing like something's at stake is like you put the parachute on and you get in, you know, the phrase, why would I jump out of a perfectly good plane? I'll I'll never do it. I just would have a nervous breakdown before. I think I'd love falling to the earth after the parachute opened, but I just don't think I'd be able to do it. That's faith, belief that something's at stake and you do something. It would be like when you get sick or you get an infection and you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription and you go get this prescription filled and you have faith that it will help you get better and heal you so you take the medication according to instructions. You don't just go to the doctor. You don't just get the medication. You take the medication active like there's something at stake getting well. You believe that the person you're about to marry is going to be faithful to you and loves you more than anyone else, won't break your heart, won't break your spirit, so you give yourself to that person mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Something is at stake. You get what I'm trying to say about belief. You believe like there's something at stake. We've made it all the way to verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. That's easy for us to understand. It's a basic tenet of us work, of us working in the economic system that we work, not for free. We work to get paid. 
right? But with righteousness, with unrighteousness, it's not an economic system. It's a spiritual system that we're talking about. Verse 5, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, you should be like circling how many times faith is in this chapter, is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Quotations here, these are cross-references from the Old Testament. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, that's Psalm 85, verses 2 and 3. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin, Psalm 35, verse 1. So does this mean that we just believe, we just believe, and we don't do anything more? Is that what that means? This section of Scripture is still talking about justification, a work of God, not a work of you, a work of God. That's what justification is. But there is something to move on to. There's something else. What might it be today? Faith, your faithfulness. Have you ever worked really, really hard for something that you think will pay off in the future, so you invest in it now? Just, not just money, but you invest in it now because you're certain that things will turn out the way you think they're going to turn out, the way they're supposed to turn out. I remember a story of, of faith from years and years ago when I was first a pastor. It was in the East Valley, and we had started a brand new church, and we were meeting in a school, and right behind the school was all this land that was undeveloped. It was in Gilbert. And we, through some miracles, we acquired some land. And even before we acquired the land, we thought that that was probably where we were going to be. So we had these prayer vigils on this land that was nothing. There was like wheat fields. There was the school we were at. We could see it. But we would set up and we'd have all night prayer vigils. It was such a cool time. It was a really cool time to stay up. We'd have three-hour shifts in the middle of the night to pray for what God might do in Gilbert. So fast forward to a number of years later, more than 10 years later, I had gone to another church by then in the Northeast Valley, and a friend had died, and his services were at that church. It was just such a cool moment, because in the funeral, the, the funeral wasn't cool. It was, because he was a follower and believer of Jesus, so it was cool, but it was sad. But I was sitting there and thinking, oh my goodness, this is where we had the bonfire. This building, and there was multi built more. It was a campus. This was one of the many buildings that I had sat there and prayed for with my wife years and years before. No one knew who we were. It was like, oh, these people prayed for this church. No, they had no idea who we were. We got to be there. It was the coolest moment, one of the coolest moments. We believed God was up to something. God was up to something. And we came and got to be a part of something that God used us and called us to back then. It was, it was just a cool thing. That's the kind of faith that we're talking about here. So let's go on to verse 9. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've talked about this. This was a, a part of the law that they thought everyone needed to follow to be a follower of Jesus. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. There's faith again. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Abraham is used as this, this example, this beacon of living by faith, being counted as righteousness. So his righteousness was not based on works, i.e. circumcision. It was based on what God did. It wasn't based on what he did or didn't do. God came to him first. God is the great initiator. He is the faithful one. So he simply believed and received the sign of circumcision as a seal of this relationship between God and Abraham. You just did that too when we took communion. That's what we did. It was a seal of what Jesus did for you and that you believe that and you believe like something's at stake, the eternity of your soul. So a promise is always an accounts receivable transaction. You don't have to be an accountant to understand that. A promise is always an accounts receivable. You know what I mean? A promise is given for a thing that hasn't arrived yet. 
The promise is given. It's something that will come in the future. It's not there yet. It's actually not even real yet, but it's promised. Have you ever been promised something that's just like out of bounds? It's just too impossible? It could possibly happen, but you believe it anyway? I'm not a big promise maker, and this is why. I love to be able to make a promise, but I will only make a promise because I do not want to break a promise. I'll only make the promise if I know for certain that I have the resources, even in that moment, to deliver the promise. If I don't have the resources, then I won't make a promise because I don't want to let you down. I'll go to God with that. He'll keep helping me with that. But that's how we are. You see, God has all the resources. God can make the promise and he can deliver. He did for Abraham and he can for you. In the meantime, Abraham believed actively. That's how our faith should be. We believe actively actively in things that might even seem impossible for us. We believe in this righteousness thing, the things we've talked about in chapters 1 through 3, that we can be made righteous. We believe that we are forgiven. We believe that we can have a clean slate after we're forgiven and we don't have to sin anymore. But is there more than that? Is there more? And this next section of Romans tells us that there's more. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. I hope someone's counting and you can tell me how many times faith. I didn't count them. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void because they couldn't keep all the law. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, and the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist yet. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. So verse 16, we talked a little bit about the key words there. It repeats it, justification, redemption, propitiation. If you remember, justification is we're made right. Redemption is we return to our inherent value that God put there in the first place. And propitiation is the mercy seat of Jesus dwelling right beside us. So it depends on God's grace, but it's activated by our faith. God is the initiator, but we respond in faith. We have to believe those things. We have to believe that God will give us grace through Jesus Christ. We have to believe in that intrinsic value that we had in the first place. We have to believe that we can be redeemed and return to God's good intentions, good and holy and righteous intentions. And we have to believe that Jesus is co-mingling with us, even in the midst of our sin. So all of that is out here stuff, and it is a pretty intellectual exercise. We have to believe it even if it seems like we doubt it more than we believe it. We decide to believe. I want to remind you of something that I say to people, and sometimes when I say this to people, they do the tilt. It's like they think I'm a little crazy, they think uh, they're a little bewildered by it, and they doubt what I have to say, and this is it. The face made ingredient is doubt, the first ingredient. Here's the formula, doubt plus belief equals faith. Did you catch that? Doubt plus belief equals faith. In order to have faith, we have to wonder if it could be true. In order to have faith, we have to wonder if it could be true. In order to have faith, we have to wonder if it could ever actually happen. In order to have faith, we have to believe in something that isn't there yet and believe that it could be there. It starts with doubt, goes to belief, and that's what faith is. In order to have faith, that's what we have to go through. Um, I was thinking about this uh, years and years ago. I got to go to junior high camp. It was the only camp I ever got to, and I was so excited Uh, I got to get away. I helped raise my younger brother, and I needed a break. Even as a junior higher, I was so excited to go, to get away from my family. And someone, one of our neighbors, gave me this little camera back when you actually had film that you had to put in the camera. I was so excited to leave, and I was so excited to take pictures. I had packed my stuff, and the night before, everyone was gone, and I was watching television by myself in the house, and I was practicing taking pictures with no film because I couldn't waste the film. But I was so excited to go. I wanted to prepare by taking pictures, and I jammed the camera. I didn't get to take any pictures at all, but I was still so excited to go. 
That's the type of excitement we should have, that this act of faith, this that kind of excitement about what God's going to do, what he's prepared for us. Are you ready to believe that it will really happen? Are you practicing taking pictures like it's about to happen? Living now for what might happen or what you believe and have faith will happen because God's moving things forward in your life? In verse 18, it says, Abraham believed he had hope against hope. Hope against hope. Sounds like an oxymoron, something that can't be. That means that it didn't make sense. He was an old guy. His wife was an old lady. They had to believe that this would happen in, in his head, but also in the way that he lived his life. So what do you hope for against hope these days? What are you hoping for today that seems a little bit impossible? What do you live, how do you live like it's really going to happen? Or is it just this thing? Yeah, I hope, but I'm not going to live any differently about it. Is it just a feeling then? Is your hope just a feeling? Is your faith just a feeling? Or is it just thoughts? Is it just the way you're thinking? Or is it more than that? Let's keep going on. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. No unbelief did that. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. He grew strong in his faith, fully convinced, not partially, not just in thinking, that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake, but for yours, for mine. It would be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So our part in this simple but illustrious transaction is faith. We have faith. We believe in things that are difficult in the least, impossible at the most, and then we do more than think about it and hope for it. We move forward in active faith. There's some work to be done after our faith is declared. We just don't sit on our hands. We just don't fold our hands in prayer. We do stuff like we're faithful people, not just people thinking about what God's up to. There's some work to be done while God is pulling all the things together. Abraham did more than believe. He did some stuff. He took some action. He put his money where his mouth was. He moved forward into the promise. He actually moved. He picked up and moved more than once. Let's not get confused here about whose job is whose. God is the great initiator. God is the promise maker. God is the promise deliverer, but we are the engagers of the promise. Catch it? God offers it. We engage it. He did things. Abraham did things to engage the promise like Alka-Seltzer and water. I don't know which one we are, but think about that with your faith. How many times do you, when you think about faith, believe God in theory only, but not moving forward in faith in the way that you live your life? We believe that God can and will make our life better, but we don't seek Him. We don't seek His righteousness. We don't read our Bible. We only come to church 1.6 times a month, which is the national average, and our church isn't actually much different. We don't do anything different like we did before. We act like an unrighteous person, not just in moments, but we act like an unrighteous person in lifestyle. Abraham had a lifestyle of faith. He moved forward. He had some moments. You can read his story, some bad moments, some questionable moments, even despicable moments as he engaged God's promise. But he kept believing and he kept engaging and God kept coming through. So if we really believed like there was something at stake, then we would move forward like there was something at stake. We would do some things that we're not doing. We would stop doing some things that we are doing. We want God and we believe God will make our finances better, but we don't tithe, which God says for us to do and says, test me in this, the only one. We want our finances to get better, but we're not going to trust God and give anything to the church. We believe that God will make our careers better, but we work no differently than the people who don't know Jesus, who don't follow Jesus, and people don't even know that you're a person of faith. We ask God to bail us out emotionally and relationally, but we don't trust Him with our mental health, and we don't go to Him for healing, and we don't even go to Him about the relationships that we form. We believe that God will make our marriage better, 
but we still give our kids, our jobs, our hobbies, the best of us, and the leftovers to our spouse, which is not the biblical model. We believe that God will make me a happier person, but we will not go to the pain and the disappointment of our past, and we just stay unhappy and bitter. We don't trust God with our past. We believe that God will dot, 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 but we don't dot, dot, dot. You believe that God will do something, you fill in the blank, but you won't do something. You won't be active with your life and the way you're living with God. Make no mistake again, God goes first. He is the promise maker and the promise giver. His promises are not contingent on our active faith or not. We engage the process, though. Our faith is made bigger when we take action and we don't just think about it. Or we don't just ask God to bless our efforts. We join him in what he's already up to. Have you ever got something for nothing? Tina and I bought our first house in the, in the valley here, in the East Valley, in the early 1990s. It was a big step for us. We decided we were part of a church. It was pre-pastor days. It was the church I became a pastor in, but I wasn't a pastor yet. And we were just starting our careers. We had just moved up here. Some things were working. Some things weren't working. But we decided it was time to buy a house. Um, we bought the house. And I think it was about two and a half years later, by then I had become a pastor. And we started that church I just told you about. And we sold our house so we could be closer to that church, right by the wheat field that became the church. And we made a whopping $14,000 on our house, and it blew my mind. I was in my 20s. I was like, what? I didn't do anything. I just lived here. Instead of paying rent, and I made $14,000. It's the easiest money I ever made. I couldn't believe Did we not do anything, though? Did we really do nothing? No. There were things that we didn't understand. There were things that we didn't know. We couldn't control everything. We couldn't know or understand everything. But we stepped into it. We signed the mortgage, we bit the mortgage bullet, and it didn't shoot us. We got $14,000 to put in the next house. That's the type of faith that I'm talking about, that we engage the promises of God he offers to us, but we take the steps. Even if we don't fully know if it's going to work out, even if we can't control everything about it. So here's my indictment for us from Romans 4. We are people of too little faith because we want to control too much and know too much. I think that's our problem. That's why we're not active faith livers, people who live in faith. In today's world, we are people of too little faith. We are, take too little action that requires faith because we want to know what we want to know, when we want to know it, we want to know it before we make a decision, and we want to have everything figured out and controlled and anticipated with the contingency plans, and we want to do it when we're ready to do it, when we know everything about it. And that's not faith when it comes to God. Control and knowledge are the great enemies of faith. Your control and your knowledge are great enemies of faith. You lose a job. What do we do? We want to know when the next job is. We want to know what how the salary is. We want to know what the company is. We want to know when we start. We want to control it. We get sick. We want to know how long we're going to get sick and how we can get better. We have problems with our kids, and we just want to reset and damage the control. We have problem relationships, and we just want them out of our life and to con get control over that death. We don't want to deal with it, and we certainly don't want the pain of loss. So what do we do instead? We live in active faith, not in us, but in God. We keep moving forward in faith into the things that we can't fully know and the things we can't fully understand while we wait for God's promises. We move forward in thinking and doing both. We just don't believe and act when it's going well. We believe in and act when it's not going well. We don't just believe and act when things are moving along according to our schedule. We believe and we act when things aren't moving along according to our schedule. We don't just believe and act when it seems like a really good idea and we present it to God and God says, that's not a good idea at all, Carlisle. That's not what we're going to do. We have faith even in that. So here's the implications. Here's what we've learned this morning. Faith is God's love language. Stop and think about that. It's what he asks us to give him. So start to see our faith as a way to minister to God. He revels in your faith. You can bring joy. You can bring joy to God with your faith. Works don't produce faith. We do. How can you strengthen your faith? Next one. We not only believe, but we act on our belief. 
So what faith actions are you not taking these days because you got to know and you got to control too much? And the next one, faith empowers and produces works as we partner with God in His work. We join Him, not the other way around. How can you partner more actively with God and what He's up to in you and around you? So this is, I want to put some, uh, some rubber on the road here. How will this look for you? I don't know. I just thought about this. I'm going to share six things that I am actively living in faith, three for me and three for us as a church, that I'm taking steps. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's scary for me, but I'm doing it anyway. So I'm learning how to be a man who lives as a disciple of Jesus more than I don't. Knowledge and control are enemies of my faith, just like they are for you. I've been working on a book for a few years on male friendships. I'm going to finish that book. I'm in my last chapter, and hopefully it'll be done. You can hold me accountable by the end of the year. <sighs> Got to do it. I'm learning how to love my wife even better as we approach our 60th decade of life and approach our 40th year of marriage. I'm discovering things about her even to this day. The one this week, I was like, what? I didn't know that. White chocolate peanut clusters. I'm going to make some for her. I didn't know it was a thing for her. Okay, so uh, those are some of my personal things. Here's church things. Building a, a church of people who live as disciples of Jesus. Not just making disciples, but people who live as disciples of Jesus. And because I'm nearing my sixth decade of life, handing off the church to the next generation is so important to me. So important to me. I don't know how that's all going to work out. I love being a pastor. I have a hard time imagining not being one and retiring and reallocating, but I'm moving forward on that. And here's one. The rubber hits the road on this right now. Getting the church ready for an increased rent. Our rent's going up in two months because of inflation and $5, five fifty a gallon gas. Our giving's down, and yet our demands are up. Our lease is up in two years, and we want a permanent home. Those are big things that cause me to lose sleep. But I'm trying to sleep in faith and knowledge that God's made promises to journey because we're making a difference for him and our community. I want to live with faith for the future that God has for me. And I want to live now like I believe he's going to do these things, not just ideas. I'm not just going to pray. I'm doing things. I'm stepping forward in faith like those things really matter because they really matter. I'm stepping forward in faith like something's at stake because something is at stake. It's people in our community that don't know Jesus. So I'm stepping forward in faith. I want to hear God's calling, and I want to lead, follow his leading as I follow him into the future. So I have a formula. I gave you that formula, faith plus, uh, faith is doubt plus belief. Here's a new formula. God's calling plus God's leading plus our following, your following, is a different, bigger, God-glorifying future. That's what active faith is. That's the formula. God's calling on your life. God's leading and you following both of those things. And then it's bigger, it's better, it's bolder. It's things that you never could believe that you were a part of, like praying in a field that later becomes this campus that's reaching lots of people. So that's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for all of us. Would you pray with me about our act of faith? Jesus, we thank you so much that you're changing us, that you're transforming us, and that you give a hope for a future, things that we imagine and long for because we like them, things that we imagine and long for because they're part of your kingdom work. May we be people, may we be individuals that follow your leading and hope for things that are bigger than us because you are bigger than us, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So as we finish up, a couple of minutes over, a couple of things to share. So you can step back at the table back there. Prayer is one of our core values. So there's people that can pray with you if you want to take a step of faith But Jesus is your Savior. We had a, uh, a an 11, a 10-year-old, no, 11-year-old, pray the prayer of salvation to receive Jesus in our lobby just this morning. So if you want to do that, there's people that can help you do that. Um, and if there's something else going on, you can do that. But I want to pause. We don't always get to do this. But um, I just found out before I came up that one of our dear friends that lives um, in Camp Verde now, Patty McKay, um, she has some pretty bad cancer. And she just started chemo on Wednesday, and she's in the ER, and it's not looking good at this very moment. So I want to pause and pray. We don't always get to do that for everyone, so don't get upset if I don't pray for you next Sunday if something happens. Sometimes we get an opportunity. Today is an opportunity. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Jesus, we love Patty. She has made such a difference in the life of our church uh, in so many ways. She is one of those people like Thomas Chisholm. Her faith is so big. 
and we're so scared and we're so sad, but we're not because she's so noble and she trusts you. But right now she's suffering and so is Dennis and all of her kids just happen to be there this weekend and we don't know what might be happening. So Jesus, would you um, continue to let the treatments treat her well and heal her? But if that's not what you're up to, she has a blessed hope that she has based her whole life on. Uh, be with her in these moments, regardless of what you're doing. So be with Patty. Thank you that we can come to you when we are scared and don't know what else to do.